You're not going to want to miss this episode of the AI show where we talk all about data preparation. Actually, it's 80% of the stuff data scientists do, but it's not very exciting. But, you but it is the most important. Make sure you tune in. Hello and welcome to this episode of the AI show where we're going to take a look at some pretty interesting part. Well, it's, I don't know if it's the interesting part, but it's the <laughs> part of data science that everyone has to do, but nobody talks about. Why don't you introduce yourself, my friend? I'm Ewan Garden. I work on the AML platform team. Um, I specifically focus on the most exciting part of AML, right. always. Mm -hmm. Also the most time consuming, as we'll take a look at, mm -hmm. which is data preparation. I'm Ewan Garden, and I'm here to entertain and educate Seth for the next little while. I don't know. Like you say the most interesting bit, it's probably the part that it's like, it's like, yeah, every Saturday I got to wash my clothes, you know, otherwise I'll have dirty clothes. This feels like this part of data science has been relegated to like washing your clothes. But tell us why it should be exciting and then maybe walk us through what it actually means to do data preparation. Okay. So <clears throat> without actually having the data in a reasonably meaningful form, you can't do any modeling on it. So all your nerdy PhD stuff that you like to talk about, mm -hmm. completely useless if what I'm handing you is ditch water. Mm -hmm. And so the goal here is to take something that is arbitrarily ugly, complex, and not appropriate from consumption, which is the most important kind of qualifier here. It's you've got to make the data ready for consumption. And there's actually differences between BI and AI in this sense. I spent 20 years working in the BI and data analytics space, and the tools you would use then would be things like ETL tools, extract, transform, and load. You mm -hmm. suck some data up, you transform it in memory, and then you load it into another schema in an enterprise data warehouse, a BI system, or something like that. Right. Now, Power BI has kind of changed that. It's a lot more ad hoc, it can be a lot more dynamic, but still you're taking data from one known place to another known place. But the analysis doesn't really have too many requirements on the data other than it not be ugly. Right. We changed that a little bit by doing ELT with big data because you can't do everything in memory anymore. So now you use Spark and Hadoop and stuff like that. You read the data, you write it to the lake, and then you process it in place right. inside the lake. Agile data preparation, which is what some of the analysts and customers call it, data wrangling, take your, your, mm -hmm. your choice in terms of what term you want to use, is really about a much more interactive and iterative way of dealing with data because as a data scientist, you get given a data set you may know nothing about and that may have no schema. And your production artifact at the end is something you don't know about yet. If I turn around to you and say, hey, predict my survival on Titanic. Would I have survived Titanic, Seth, right? You're the super highly qualified nerdy guy. You've got a range of maybe 15, 20 algorithms. Right. Each one of those has a different dependency on the data, mm -hmm. requires different characteristics on the data. And so you might end up actually cleaning the data 15 to 20 different times with slightly for different the outputs model. yep, for the right. models. Right? So there's a baseline which is get it clean, but then there's prepare the data for consumption as well. And so that's something that's very unique in the AI space, I right. would argue, over generalized data integration and BI and ETL and ELT and all kinds of stuff like that. And this is something that you have to do. Like, like one of the first things I wrote was a line following robot. And it turned out that when I was training it, I never turned. So I had a lot of zeros in my data set. So I had to like do some interesting like, well, you got to take data out. You got to match. The, you got to balance the labels. You got to make sure these columns are working. It was it was a lot of work, and I found that like I wish there was some tools that could help me out with that. So maybe can you talk about like why did, you already talk about why data preparation is so important? But you talk about how what is a good way to think about it? Yeah. So a good way to think about it is a series of hypotheses and experiments which you need to validate. Mm -hmm. So you're going to turn around and say, well, I think that there shouldn't be missing values in this column because my model needs their values to be there. But now you have to come up with a set of hypotheses about how you deal with missing right. values. Should you delete the rows? If you delete 90% of the rows, then do you have enough data for a meaningful model right, now? You don't. If you delete rows because one column is missing a value, What's the side effect on the other columns in the data set at that point in time? Right. Because those other columns might be really important predictor columns for some other algorithm you're right, using. Right. One of my favorite quotes here is I was running a bunch of focus groups before we built the current AML uh, product that you know. We had a bunch of BI people and we had a bunch of AI people in the room. And the question I said was, okay, you're dealing with IoT data. And the heart rate sensor is plodding along. It's like 60, 65 beats per minute. And then all of a sudden, you get 10 readings at 500 and then it drops down to 60, 65 again. Clearly the person didn't die, we're happy about that, yeah. but what do you do with the data? So the BI guy immediately says, well, it's clearly bad data, so I'd filter it out as part of the ETL process. The AI guy turns around and goes, no. I would turn around and I would either impute a new value because it's clearly outside normal range, 
or I would build a model which was able to handle outliers for that column because there may be other attributes of that row of data which are really critical right. to my model. Right. And so the techniques you use are actually ML for ML. So most people doing data engineering for BI are not going to use sophisticated techniques to impute missing data. They might compute the mean or the average and stuff like that. They're not going to look at distributions. They're not going to use featureizers like scalars and mm -hmm. things like that to get the data into a really, really good shape. And so that's kind of one of the fundamental differences that exists. Awesome. Well, let's dive in. Show me how to do the thing. Okay. So let's go ahead. Um, I've got a very simple example here. Um, that I won't make you do because that would just humiliate you live yeah, on stage. Yeah, I, I would be, it would be terrible. People would laugh for years. Um, and this is a very simple example. It's using the Titanic data. Very common for tutorials. There's thousands of examples of how to do this on the web. There's a great Kaggle competition and everything else like that. So we have this particular version we call Dirty Titanic. And I'm going to use a library called Pandas here in Python. Anybody that's done any sort of data science at least knows of Pandas, whether they use it or not. Mm -hmm. Written by a gentleman called Wes McKinney. It's been around for years. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to read that file. So the first thing we get is we get an error. So I'm reading a CSV file, and the, you know, it says I'm reading a CSV file. The file's got a CSV on the end, so why didn't it work? Right. So the first step we have to start doing now is start trying to understand our data. We so we go, take, stuff, yeah. we go take a look at this, and we use everybody's favorite tool for debugging files, which is Notepad++. Of course. So if we look at this file, we go, OK, that looks kind of interesting. There's a blank block at the top. There's, it's a CSV, but it's got pipe delimiters in the middle of it. And if you actually look down the file far enough, you'll see that there's what we call weird ragged edges to the schema. So there's not the same number of columns in every single position. And it's remarkably common uh, that CSV is really the world's most non-standard standard format when it comes to data. And this is making me unhappy because I'm looking at it and I'm like, oh, geez, I got to write something to fix this stuff. That's what you got to go do. Yeah. So let's go back to Spider. And we'll cheat a little bit, because I've done this particular example a couple of times. And we'll take a look at what we'd have to do to fix it. So the first thing I have to do is change the separator. Then I have to tell it to skip a certain number of rows. That might have worked, but what I know, because I'm saving time on your busy schedule uh -huh. here, is that there's actually also hidden at the bottom of this file, which we can read because it's a reasonable sized file. It's only a few hundred rows. It's, there's actually a trailer at the end of this file as well, which will also screw up a read. Yeah. And so you've got to try the read, and the read will then fail again. And it's an iterative process, like I was saying. You're going to try it. You're going to get a little bit further every single time. Um, and so in this particular case, we know how to fix that. There's luckily in Pandas, there's a skip footer. But there's a trick you have to do here. If you want to skip the footer, you can't use the C parser for the file, which is the super fast one, because it doesn't support skip footer. And now you have to go and switch to a Python one. So this is a very evolutionary process. And if you don't know this stuff, if you don't read dirty CSVs every single day or deal with some of these weird eccentricities that sure. happen in the data set, you're going to hit it, and then you're going to go to Stack Overflow, and you're going to go find somebody else who's found the same thing, and you're slowly building up knowledge about the data. Okay? So let's go ahead and just execute that line. We'll see if we get a nice clean read of the data. Turns out we do. We go take a look in the debugger. We can see that we now have a data frame. And you can see here there's a bunch of data in here. And there's names of people. There's their sex. And if you sort this, you can start to see that you know, there's missing stuff and there's weird ages. I know you're a young man, but I'm pretty sure you're not 0.75 no. years old, Seth. I remember when I was 0.75. It was the greatest time of my life. Um, and if you take a look at this body column, it's, got, it's full of nans, which is not a number in Python. So this is pretty much standard for data sets that we see. So it's kind of ugly. Um, but now, if I was to throw this straight at sklearn or at some sort of algorithm, they'll barf. Because there's missing data, the data's not of the right type, it's not of the right format. I'll save you the embarrassment of going ahead and doing that. And let's go and take a look at how we could perhaps fix this by creating a new derived data set here. So because we're in speeding along, I'm going to take the simplest route possible through this ugly data. I'm going to drop every single column that causes me problems in my model, whether it's an interesting column or not, I'm just going to drop it. And so we'll do that by simply dropping those columns. And then I'm going to drop all the rows that are left that have any, any value in them at all. Oh, this is painful to watch. OK. So the thing to look here is look in the Variable Explorer window top right. So we went from 11 columns to 6 columns with the drop. And we've gone from 1,309 rows to 1,000 rows. So we've dropped 30%-ish of our data because there was one missing value. Okay, not perhaps the best strategy, no. but if you pay me a little, I can come up with some better strategies in a second. There's got to be a way to do this a little bit better. And so if we go ahead and we'll just write that out. Let me switch to my modeling file here. So here we've got a very simple set of models. Um, I'm simply going to reread the data again. I'm going to say I want to predict whether somebody survived or not. I'm going to split the data, test, and train, which is a standard technique. And then I'm simply going to run a logistic regression, a random forest, and a decision tree. 
and I'm going to print out the results from the three of those guys. So let's go ahead and run them. And you can see we're in the 0 0.66, 0 0.67 range, which that's what's slightly better than tossing a coin, but it doesn't justify your PhD or your vast no, salary I to know. get a 60-ish number. Here, and here's the sad bit. Like, you've basically gone through, like, this is everything a data scientist would try first. Yep. Like, you would basically be like, okay, let's just do the dumbest thing first so that I don't have to pull my hair out later. And you would literally run a logistic regression, uh, a logistic regression classifier, a random forest, and what was the other decision tree? tree. Yep. Because those are the ones that usually get the fastest bang for your buck. And then you would find out that you get 66%. Yeah. And then this is where the ugly work ha happens. And it's generally not trying a different model. It's fixing the data. Correct. And that's what we'll do now. Right. And again, this is a difference in data prep for AI versus other consumption patterns. Because if you're predicting the sales figures or you're measuring the sales figures for your organization, you're going to turn around and say, the data is either right or not. Because I'm going to have some sort of verification process in my data warehouse that extracts from LTP sure. system and everything else like that. You're either right or wrong. Right. right? Here is 66% right or wrong. Is it right enough? Is it too wrong? It's this weird gray area, and can we make it better? And how much of messing with the data is still a valid thing to go do, right? If I start creating synthetic data, time series is a great example mm -hmm. where you create synthetic uh, representations of data over sliding windows because you can't throw that much data at the algorithms. It's not the actual data from the system that I'm running my model on. I'm running on synthetic data yeah. that I created from the raw data. So we're in this very interesting space. Okay, so let's go back and let's take a different approach uh, much more of a kind of Seth, I'm actually highly qualified uh, PhD sort of approach. And we'll go ahead and we'll reread the data and we'll drop less columns than we did before. So I'm just going to reread that file again. Uh, oh, excuse me, I've got to import a new set of libraries here. And let's go ahead and we will drop some columns because I know having played with the data, which I saved you the, uh, me doing it, the home destination column is not particularly good, your ticket number is not interesting, name is not interesting, which boat you were in when you survived isn't actually an indicator yeah. of whether you, you were going to survive or not, whether you found your body or not, not such a good indicator, yeah. and also which cabin you're in. Okay, So we're going to go ahead and drop those columns because they're not good from a model perspective, they're also kind of dirty. I'm going to step through a series of, you can call them data preparation steps, you can call them featureization steps, we blend all of that together because sure. it doesn't really matter. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to map the sex column because if we go back in here and take a look at this code that does this, a lot of classifiers don't like categorical variables. They want zeros and ones. They want numbers. And if you have male, female, or MF, yeah. there's a whole range of algorithms you simply can't use. Basically, it all comes down to converting your square of data into numbers. Somehow yes. or other. It all comes down to you have to know how you're consuming your data to prepare it. Right. And I talked earlier on about multiple different branches. So we have a bunch of missing data in the age column. And the age column feels like it might be an interesting sure. one from the data set perspective. So in this case, I'm going to compute median. Even with an example like something as simple as computing median, you have a choice. If you can compute median over the entire data set, are you going to force some sort of distribution, uniform distribution yeah. of the data yeah, set? Yeah, you are. Or should you group by first class, second class, third class? Should you group by whether they're parents or not, whether they're children right. or not, what their title is? And so again, come up with a hypothesis, try the hypothesis, evaluate success failure, and compare multiple different options of your hypothesis to work out which one gives you the best answer. And this is the same kind of issue you have when you're trying to convert like, uh, like continuous numbers into bins. Like how big should your bins be? Are you assuming anything about your distribution? Like if it's a if it's a if it's, a, if it's a, a, not a uniform but like a Gaussian distribution, and your bin covers like two standard deviations to the mean, you just you got three bins and nothing's going to do anything. It's not very predictive, and so there's a lot of like trying stuff out. That feels yeah, like. it's why histograms are both the most loved and most hated technique in data science for doing exploratory data analysis, because you can sit down with a histogram and simply by changing the start position and the width of the bins, you can end up with completely right. different views on the data. And that's why even using histograms is an iterative process and you should try multiple different approaches to a histogram display to make sure you get the right answer coming back out the other side. Okay, So I'm going to drop uh, NAs because I've imputed the missing values now for the column I think I care about. So if there are NAs in any of the columns, uh, then it's okay now because I've got the thing I think is most important. I've imputed that. I'm going to use a standard scaler here to scale the fares into a consistent range, which some algorithms work better with a narrower range in terms of how they work. Um, and then I'm going to do what's called handle the embarked column, and I'll show you that in a second. And then we're going to drop the embarked column because I don't want the original. So let's go back through here, and we'll take a look at what we're doing with these last couple. Oh, yeah. And this is a lot of code. I mean, like you're, 
you're obviously going through this super fast, but there was a lot of code that you wrote and had to scare up and write and figure out if it even did anything. If, you're, if you really want to nerd out on this stuff, there's a Kaggle competition, I think, from 2015 on the Titanic data set. And when it starts, the first few scores are like a 0.79 out of the box, because that's what scikit-learn will do if you do a little bit of work on the data. And then you can see the scores progressing over time, and finally somebody nails it and gets a one. If you look at how much work each of the different people had to do to draw, drive the scares up, it's, some of it's in the algorithms, like parameters and tuning the algorithms sure. and using different algorithms, but a lot of it is in the what featureizers am I using and how am I messing with right. the data. Okay? So here's what we're doing for handle embarked. And the trick we're doing with handle em, to handle embarked is we're creating a dummy variable. So embarked in the Titanic data set says, which city do you start on? And so it's a letter which indicates whether you uh, boarded at Southampton or wherever. Again, it's a categorical variable. The algorithms can't do anything with it. So in this case, instead of doing a map, what we actually do is create dummy variables, which is where we create a column for each one of the variable values, and then mm -hmm. we do 0, 0, 001, 0, 1, 0 to indicate what that was. A lot of classification algorithms work much better with that structure of data than they will do with a kind of map style so of data. So it's basically like a one-hot encoding. There's three or four different ways of encoding. I just did dummy for this one. Right. Um, you can do one-hot encoding as well. And so that's what that trick is doing there. Um, and then that's really what we're doing. There's the example I said for scaling the fares. So that's just using a standard scaler that's built into the preprocessor. And we do a very simple median here on the age, as I was mentioning earlier. But we could group by, we could use distributions to compute rather than a simple median. You have many options and many hypotheses to go ahead and try here. So if we go ahead back here, we'll go ahead and finish up. So we'll just go ahead and write this file out. And we're just going to write this same file back out. And we'll go back to our modeling code. And we'll go ahead and we'll just read our modeling code. Now remember, we were in the high 60s was the score that we were able to get by using that quick and dirty approach. If we go ahead and run that, we're now up in the high 70s. 10 points is nothing to laugh at. Correct. And that was relatively simple processing of the data here. There's a lot more you can do. And if you go to Kaggle, you'll see all the other examples that people uh, so have used. You basically say it's relatively simple processing. It is. But the amount of time that it takes to arrive at those things is not going to be, you're spending a couple of days just doing stuff like this. Correct. Yeah. And, and that's frustrating for sometimes for people and for organizations, which is, you know, we say, um, you know, we have empirical evidence at Microsoft from surveys we've done, interviews we've done with customers. Anything between 80 and 150% of the time on an advanced analytics project is spent on the data preparation. Mm -hmm. So you've got all your, uh, you know, PhD guys who you want to be letting loose on models and really thinking about hard things about how they represent the data visualization. They're sitting working out what parameters to send to a CSV reader, what featureizers to use. Um, and, you know, most of the analysts will agree with that number. So that 80% number is an industry recognized number and it's all stuff like, this. And it's generally stuff that people don't talk about because, I mean, it's not exciting. <laughs> no. Well, and the step that's missing here, what we did, great, I got everything working here inside Spider on my laptop. This is a small data set. Mm -hmm. Let's say it was a billion rows. Now you've got to go get this working scalably, reliably. What happens if the data gets updated once an hour because it's IoT data? Oh. What happens when you add a new region of product sales because you're taking product data in or you a new class of device or something like that? Just think about how exponential the complexity is in terms of the classic big Vs of big data, but also this stuff, you've got to get it to scale. You've got to get it, make it secure, right. repeatable. Otherwise, the project fails. Awesome, so how would you summarize the whole data prep stuff? I think it's still the coolest part. But it's also, quite frankly, the most important part. Yeah. Because if you don't get the data right, then it doesn't matter how smart your algorithms are, how smart you are at doing algorithms, then you're starting from a pretty bad position. So you've got to get the data right, and you've got to think about data differently for AI than you think of how you think about data in the case of something like BI or general data engineering. And just to finish up, any tips for people that are struggling with this right now? Yeah, work hard. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much for spending some time with us. We've been learning all about data preparation, what it looks like. I'm pretty excited about it sometimes. <laughs> but I think that I do get really excited about it when it actually you can see jumps in, in accuracy and precision and that kind of stuff. It's pretty cool. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Take care.